Welcome, everybody. This is Nick Federoff on Gardening, where we talk about America's number one hobby, gardening, landscaping, and to help you out with all of your indoor and outdoor living ideas. I, I, was, I, was, I was at a location today for a television shoot, and we're going to be working at this place, and they need a brand new landscape. So we're not going to do the whole thing. We're just going to do little bits and pieces to show you what curb appeal is. And it's pretty exciting, pretty fun. I haven't done something like this in a long time. And a lot of it's actually going to be just hands-on with this thing. So we're going to take a look at the at the porch and what it takes to make a very inviting porch. It's a real small area. So we'll go through that and we'll look at the, look at the, the actual porch itself. We're going to paint it. So you're going to see what it is to paint a porch. We're going to decorate it. We're going to put things that are garden-related. Uh, well, we have a window that's there. We might even change out the window and the sill and all that because it looks kind of yucky. Or we may just leave it alone and just show you how it would look if you put those elements there, the gardening elements, to make this place look better and make it shine if you don't have the budget for that. So it's pretty cool. But anyway, when I was I was there, and it happened to be their trash day. And I got so excited about this. In fact, I even bragged to it about Pam a little bit earlier, where when I was there, what I did was that I ended up when I when I was there, I was I was looking at this. I was I was looking at the, you know, assessing the whole area. The trash man came. Now, that's not that's not that's not unusual because everybody has a trash service. And it seems like that there's these, you know, the cities, they end up turning into these communistic societies and you are forced to use their trash cans. You can't use your own trash cans. You remember those days where you used to take your 30-gallon up to 50-gallon tr uh, trash can and it was usually either made out of cardboard or was it made out of steel or it was made out of tin or it was made out of aluminum or it was made out of plastic. Yeah, I do go back to the cardboard ones and they would take them and they would put them in there and you could have 30 trash cans if you wanted to as long as you filled them up and they weren't too heavy these guys would just fill up the trash take it and run with that but no all of a sudden the long arm of the union or whatever it is comes in there and by the way i'm a union guy so don't get mad at me uh what happened was that they um, um uh, uh, uh abolished all of that and when they abolished all of that they ended up bringing in uh, what is called the lowest bid for your services that's supposed to be the lowest bid for your services myself i think there's a lot of payoff going on there but i don't want to get political on this show so anyway you're forced to use their trash cans and after i saw the uh, couple of the trash cans being dumped across the street an old-fashioned thing that i have not seen in years i am talking absolutely a whole lot of years was that the trash can the people across the street there was two different people two different yards uh two different owners they uh, and by the way their houses were are very nice they're very nice homes you could tell the people take uh, take care of them. They're nothing fancy. Not a fancy neighborhood whatsoever. In fact, I would say that this is in more of a depressed area than it is a nice area. But the people across the street, they do they really take pride of ownership because you could tell the houses are painted. There's no peeling paint anywhere. They've got nice fences around them or they don't have any fences at all and they mow their lawns. They have flowers. They have trimmed plants. It's really pleasant to look across and see this. Anyway, what I saw these two people doing at two different times, I'm looking. I said, I can't believe my eyes. The man across the street had a hose in his hand. He had the trash can on his lawn, and he had the black trash can. That's the one that you usually put the, the yucky trash in. Opens it up, takes his hose in there, and was washing it out. Who washes 
their trash cans out any longer. I'll tell you who. That guy's next door neighbor. She pulls out. She pulls hers out, and she's washing hers too. I, you know, I was I was kind of awestruck over this. I really not was I am awestruck. It was so cool to see that, and that right there just reflects in the homes that these people have. The curb appeal is just awesome. Now, you know what? I would imagine that if you walked into their house, it's probably got holes all over the place. They probably have cockroaches just swarming everywhere. There's ants. There's all kinds. No, there probably isn't. The place, the place is probably immaculate inside. But it's just kind of refreshing to see that you can go in an area that isn't a hotsy totsy overpriced, lower-income area. This is not middle class by far. This is a lower income area. And especially on that one side of the street, there's nothing special about it. Actually, there, there, there kind of is. Now, if you look uh, catty corner, because the property where I'm at is on a corner. And it's a one huge, maybe just two short blocks. Maybe it's one big block to a main street. Anyway, on the uh, across the street, there's four homes that are these monster mini mansions. Do you have mini mansions in your town? Mini mansions are becoming very popular. These are overbuilt homes on small lots. And what they do is that they build these two-story homes that have huge columns, beautiful clay roofs, they have this Roman architecture look to them, and they're literally popping up all over in different towns. In fact, one town that I know of, not far from here from the thingsgreen.com botanical gardens, they ended up having to put a moratorium on it. Why they started it, I don't know. But anyway, they build these homes almost with zero clearance, so when you're driving down the street, You have two or three mansions, mini mansions, and then you have some really cruddy houses. And then you have two or three mini mansions. And I think the idea was to build these mini mansions so that the neighborhoods can get better. Because all of a sudden you say, well, I want a house like that. I want a house like that. And then before you know it, it becomes a deal. It becomes a big deal for people to get these mini mansions. I don't know how big they are inside, but they definitely go two stories. I would imagine what happens is you come walking in, you get a big Fourier, and you have stairs that go upstairs, maybe a circular thing. They're probably very pretty. The outsides are really nice. Anyway, so you have four of these houses that are by themselves, or I should say across the street, hard caddy corner. And then you have five or six, seven houses going on down. That are this, these lovely houses. Now, on the side of the street where this one particular house is that I was at, the houses around there are just average. But what's really cool, pretty much the whole neighborhood, pretty much the whole neighborhood mows their lawns. There are very few homes that don't. And to have this in a lower income area is, is really, really encouraging. Because that tells us that you could have pride of ownership in your landscape. In fact, you know what? You can have you can have a house that is peeling paint, that is kind of falling apart. But if you take care of your landscape, that is called curb appeal. And all those other things just kind of go away. That horribleness of that home and the look of it just goes away because the house is being taken care of. The lawn is mowed. It's edged. There's no weeds. They have flowers. The plants are taken care of. And we will be back right after this. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back over here. Nick Federoff on gardening. Thank you very much for tuning in to this hour of the program. And let's see here. Hey, Ellie. Ellie, 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 check this out. Check this out. 
that's the town I was talking about here. That was just down the street from the thingsgreen.com botanical gardens, right where you live. Okay, so today's question is, do you like peaches or nectarines? Which ones do you like better, peaches or nectarines? We've already learned that there are freestone peaches and clingstone peaches. Most of your nectarines, though, are usually clingstone. There's very few that are freestone. So kind of keep that in mind when you end up answering that question. Okay, let's see here. We have Brad is writing in asking, what should I feed a pomegranate tree? Okay, a pomegranate tree, depending on where its development is, <laughs> truth be known, it really doesn't care. It really doesn't matter. You know, pomegranate trees are either a tree form or they're in a big shrub form. And you have to be careful uh, on your watering and you have to be careful on your feeding because you could split the pomegranates prematurely. You know, a lot of times they'll split themselves and they split because they're normally harvested as the weather starts to turning cooler. And then if you get if you get it too hot or get it too cold and you water too much, you rarely if you not don't water enough, but if you water too much, those things will split on you. And, and they'll just crack. And especially if it rains. Now, pomegranates are usually ready for pick on October 31st. Not October 32nd, but October 31st or a couple days earlier. Why wouldn't you do it on, on October 32nd? Well, because that's technically November 1st. And the reason why you don't is because when you grow up with the pomegranate tree that is near the front of your house, the kids will jump your fence, even if you have a dog back there, and they'll pick pomegranates and they'll throw them all over the neighborhood. I speak from experience. So normally your pomegranates are picked just before thanks, I mean, before, what did I say? Halloween. <laughs> the 31st so therefore we have to be we have to understand that the picking process of this is very crucial because it's important to know that sometimes it does rain in october in the mild parts of the country and you have to pick them before that but that doesn't help brad out as far as taking and fertilizing them Pomegranates would rather have a nice, slow feeding process. And because it's an edible fruit crop, what I would do at this time, and I was I would jump on getting myself some agro thrive. Get the agro agro thrive. It's a liquid. And therefore, because you have a tree. This is going to be really simple for you to do. I don't want you to wash, you know, a lot of times you could take and you could spray the leaves of the of the tree. But the problem with that is that you have pomegranates and, and they're susceptible to powdery mildew. Cottony cushion, too, which is an insect. But anyway, I don't want you to spray the trees. I want you to do and I want you to flood the area underneath the the canopy of the tree. Super, super simple. I'm going to assume that you have relatively nice soil. Now I'm going to assume that you don't have nice soil. So what you're going to do is that you would take something like a drill, get a drill, and get like a, a one-inch bit on there. They have these auger bits that are good for drilling into wood, and they're they're long. They're 12 inches, 18 inches long. Go to the, you know what, go to a swap meet. And you could buy these things for, you know, a couple of bucks. Makes a great tool in this way that I'm going to show you how to fertilize it. And then what you do is you come out from the center of the tree up to the drip line. And I mean, uh, not this. Well, yeah, the center of the tree, which would be the where, where the trunk is. And then you come to the end of the tree. 
where the drip line is, and then you take a drill, this drill, I mean, it's only a one inch drill, you don't have to go any bigger than that, and you get yourself a battery drill, and you drill holes all around the tree, get it down to that 12 inch mark, right to the body, don't worry about if anything comes out, any any uh, soil comes out, it will, a little bit will, don't worry about that. You can take it in and out. That's if you can walk underneath the tree. If you can't walk underneath the tree, lay down underneath the tree. I don't care. Just drill these holes underneath because you probably have never done this before. Now that you have these holes, get yourself the Agro Thrive. In fact, right now, they got a dealio going on to where you can get a couple of samples for free. You got to pay shipping and handling, but it ain't nothing for what, it, what you got to do. Go to the website, agrothrive.com. Okay, go to that website, get the samples, and then you'll follow the directions on the sample, put it in a, in a bucket, and then apply it in right where those holes that you drug, that you that you drilled. Put the holes anywhere from, from six inches to one inch, I mean, six inches to one foot apart. I don't want you to kill yourself here, especially if you can't get into the tree that well. But you do want to take and then concentrate this solution into and around these holes, pour it into the holes. And then what I need you to do is to put a pair of safety glasses on, step back a couple of feet from the tree, because that plant just might take off so fast and grow so quickly that it might poke you in the eye, and I don't want you to get hurt. So <laughs> that's what you want to that's what you want to do in a situation like that. So kind of keep that in mind when you are looking at, uh, what do you call it, when you're looking at these things, okay? All right. Tell you what, let's get to our questions over here. We're going to be talking over here at 1-800-405-NICK. And, of course, you could you could uh, bring your questions down to our website. And here we go. I'm a cautious person, and I'd like to put some plants that have pokies. So if someone scales my back wall, watch out. What do you suggest? <laughs> Not only are you cautious, you're kind of lethal at the same time. Oh, my goodness. Okay, pyracanthas. Pyracantha, have pokies. Good plant to put. You get little red berries on them. Anything in the Ilex family, I-L-E-X, Ilex family, the leaves are pokey. Those things are pokey as well. Ilex is also known as holly. So if you've ever had like a like a wreath done or seen a wreath before, there's a lot of different varieties and shapes and sizes of Ilex. So that's why I called it Ilex instead of hollies because they're not all called hollies, but they're in that same family. Here's another one that's in the same family that has pokey leaves, and that would be Mahonia. Mahonia are amazing plants because... Many of the plants also have leaves that are pokey. Not only do they have leaves that are pokey, but they also have the branches are pokey. And I'm telling you, they are nasty looking. So these are all great plants to put into windows in areas like that. And I think it's a great idea to incorporate these kind of plants. Make sure that you understand how to take them. Take caution yourself when it comes to pruning them because we want to encourage them to grow. And with the neat part about what I, the plants that I just mentioned, they all take different types of conditions from shade to sun. Once you figure out what that is, go to your local nursery and garden center and order those bad boys up. I'll be back right after this. I'm Nick Federoff, and you're listening to me at the thingsgreen.com Botanical Gardens. All right, we're back over here. Thank you very much for tuning in to this hour of the program. Ellie, she writes in, do you have any tips on growing crown of thorns? Are they low water? Do they take a lot of sun? Are they slow growing? What's the dealio with that? Okay, here's the dealio with crown of thorns. Crown of thorns is in the Mahonia family. It's Mahonia millie, millie is what I think it is. And it a uh, pretty interesting plant. It, this is the they call it. They also call it the Christ plant because they. Uh, it's total supposition that that this was the the plant that they used as a crown when Christ's crucifixion uh, came to being, uh, because the 
the branches of these things are just horribly pokey. They're bad. Then, if you look at the flowers, the flowers are red on the plant. So, therefore, that red represents blood. So, it's it's a plant that is very thorny. It gets anywhere between three feet to six feet tall, depending on how you cultivate it. It would rather have full sun because of the tiny, tiny leaves on there, and the tiny, tiny flowers on there. That's a good indication, usually, if a plant needs full sun or whether it needs shade. Although, it can tolerate middle of the road uh shade and not full full shade you would rather have more sun than anything if you live in the valley then it would be a different story when you get super super hot then you could take and put it uh, more like half and half so it's a very good plant to have it's a uh, novelty plant it's a conversation piece there's no uh, doubt about that and um that's good all right so let's keep on going over here <sighs> what are you going to welcome back let's see uh, steve writes in uh and he steve you don't like peaches nor nectarines dude what are you broken hey you can have it man like they say that's your opinion or maybe that's not your opinion that's your taste palette that's your your taste bud you know what yvette was telling me she said wrote something this is kind of interesting uh she invited people over to her house to be to pick all kinds of peaches that's what it looked like but let me see here Okay, uh, oh, come on. She says, love peaches grilled and sprinkled with brown sugar. You ever had that before? I've never had that before either. Grilled. So I would imagine you get the, I've had hot peaches. I, I love peach cobbler pie. Put the brown sugar on there. Oh, man, I'm all about that. I'd have to see about this grilling thing, though, because does the smoke Obviously, the smoke permeates through the peaches, and that right there would be, that would be kind of novelty. That would definitely be a novelty kind of thing. So, I'm thinking I'd have to try it. In our downtown district, there's these bright green trees with a light tan bark. I really like them, but the leaves look like they get curly and possibly leak. Do you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Yeah, I do. You have uh, what you have. It's very common to have this plant. I, I don't know why. I don't know why cities allow it. I really don't know why they allow this plant to be planted because it is a dirty tree. Dirty tree in many respects. By the way, it's in the ficus family, fig family, ficus, and it's probably the ficus nitida, ficus nitida. Unlike its cousin, the ficus benjamina, the ficus nitida does not have that classic pointier leaf and kind of kind of curled over, if you may, not curled on a curled over leaf that kind of bends over. So it's not as flowery, shall we say, or as cool looking as the benjamina. So the nitida is a classic street tree. It's also classic for having their roots come to the surface and bust up concrete. Absolutely a horrible tree for that. So if a city requires that to be planted, like I said, it happens all over the place. You have to take and make sure that there is a root barrier around the plant so it doesn't pick anything up. Doesn't grow up into the concrete to the sidewalk to the driveway to your asphalt to your curbs and picks it all up because it will do that that's what makes it a horrible street tree it also drops a lot of leaves now it's an evergreen so evergreens are going to drop all the time it is a very prunable tree absolutely a prunable tree loves it as a matter of fact in fact what a lot of cities do they'll take this tree and they'll wrap lights around it during christmas time or sometimes during all year and they'll use it as a perch for something like that it's really it's a really nice tree but it has its flaws as well and those are some of the flaws once you prune it it wants to be pruned all the time this tree will get 35 feet tall 40 feet tall easily it'll spread 12 to 15 feet with no problem whatsoever if not even bigger than that 
and the dropping and the mess that you see, the sticky stuff, that's not that's not the tree proper. It is and it isn't. What it is is that this tree is extremely susceptible to an insect called thrips. And the thrips are sucking insects. And once they start slurping on those leaves, those leaves actually close up on you. They literally close up on you, and it's so hard to tear them apart. When you do tear them apart, you're going to see eggs. They're really tiny. And you're going to see the thrips in there, little tiny black insects. And you're going to see how, they've, how they're living in that little environment. It's a horrible tree for that. So is it a tree that I would recommend? Well, you can grow it in the ground. You can grow it in containers. Just understand that it has those particular limitations that I just talked about. You need to feed it to keep its immunity up, immunity up so that it cannot so it cannot become weakened for the thrips to get on it. Because it's those thrips that are creating the sap from the tree and then dripping on the ground, dripping all over the place. And it gets really black and yucky on the ground and can sticky. And you have to try to clean it up somehow. So it's an interesting plant. Now you know all about it. I'm Nick Federoff. You are listening to me. Come from the thingsgreen.com botanical gardens. More information and ideas for the beginning and season gardener when we return. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. This is Nick Federoff. Here's a question. Are there different kinds of aloe vera plants, and is one better than the other, using for juice and to put sunburns on? I think that's a valid question here because there are lots of different types of aloe plants. In fact, there's several hundred different varieties of aloe, and not all of them are used for medicinal purposes, whether you take them internally or or whether you can use them for topicals, for sunburn, or whatever the case may be. As a matter of fact, it's kind of comical because back in the 70s, a very interesting trend was happening where they were getting rid of people. Well, at first, people were up on a high, you know, it, ah, people go at fads all the time. So at the time, MSG. Uh, what's that? It's monosodium glucamate. I think it's how you, it was, what that was. They were using that as a tool for health. And then they found out that MSG is no good for you. So what they started to do is they said, okay, well, how do you get your MSG out of you? You start drinking aloe vera. That's what you do. And aloe vera is horribly tasting. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. Anyway, people were taking it and they were drinking it and it's, you know, what do you, it's just crazy. Aloe vera is also used for cosmetics. So there's a lot of different things that aloe vera can be used for. So therefore, uh, which one do you use? There's several hundred different varieties of it. You just have to do your homework. That's all you have to do. You know, because aloe vera do not all look the same. The aloe vera that we're talking about for sunburns usually are the ones that have the real long leaves on them. And there's different varieties. It's usually the one that's uh, the chinensis variety. That's the one where you could take and you can peel it and you have that gelatinous material in there. You smell it. It stinks to high heaven. And then you pull it out and you can rub it on you. That even stinks after you get burned. Uh, Anyway, so there's a lot of different varieties there. And they all do different things. So definitely you want to do your homework to understand that you just don't want to start gnawing on every single variety that's out there. How do you know when to keep or pull an apricot tree? Ours is quite old. Half of it produces really well and the other half nothing. That all depends on whether or not you want to uh, keep your... How do I answer this? There's a lot of ways of doing this, okay? If the aloe tree is posing a liability to you, then you want to cut it out. Just get it out. Pull it out. If it looks like it's going to hurt somebody, and get it out. Now, if it's just a matter of if you were to take that dead-looking part or dead, uh, take and pull, yeah, take and you can cut it, 
yank it out, and then maybe the integrity of the rest of the tree is just fine. You have the choice of just bleeding that plant dry. And then if you're happy with that and it's not posing a liability, then yank these things out. I mean, then you could then you could harvest it, I should say, until it stops bringing you any more apricots. Then you could turn around and yank it out. Or what you could do is that if you take the plant at this particular moment, again, making sure that there's no liability problem, wait till the harvest is over, pull the tree out. Then you fortify that soil, get the trunk out too. You can't just pull the tree out. You got to pull the trunk out. And by the way, you know, you can use apricot wood for, uh, for food, what do you call it, for smoking? Not, you know, like that smoking, uh, smoking your foods. You take it, cut it up in tiny little chunks, and then allow it to thoroughly dry. It's going to take a year for it to do that. Then you can use it for smoking, for barbecuing, and like that. So that's kind of a cool thing. And the next thing that you could do is you have, now that you have this area that's clear of an of a apricot tree, typically we don't like planting trees or plants back in the same hole. But if you do this right now, or I should say after it's giving you your harvest and you pull it out, you grub out and pull that stump, then I would say you take that hole and you just fortify it. Bring in some soil, bring in some compost, bring and then mix it up really well. Water it, maybe even get some grass to grow in there. Then what you're going to end up doing is you're going to allow the plant, you're going to allow that soil just to rest. Let it rest until next December, January. Then what you can do is go to your local nursery or garden center and either buy another apricot that is suited for your area, get a peach or nectarine or whatever it is, and you can replace that tree. You can get one of those three-in-ones. Those are kind of cute. I actually saw a three-in-one a couple of days ago, and it was doing so well. Usually what happens with a three-in-one, you know what I'm talking about? They'll take a nectarine, a peach, and an apricot, and they graft them all together so you have three trees in one tree but usually what happens is that uh, a couple of them the most dominant will take over and kill off the third one but this one was just absolutely perfect yeah it was really really cool so it can happen but you have to take care of it all right we have to take care of a commercial break right now because that's how i feed my family and that's how the radio stations are able to feed their families because you listen to the commercial you buy the stuff that the advertiser is hawking and everybody is good and the economy is just awesome when you participate that way. I'll be back right after this. We are so back over here. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? I hope you're getting out there and doing some gardening. Get your fingers dirty, for goodness sakes. This kind of dirt is a good thing. I'm telling you right now. All right, let's hop to it. The other day, I saw my neighbor put on some really pretty mulch on her flower beds. I come to find out it's paint chips. <laughs> that can't be good, can it? <laughs> yeah, paint chips. It's a thing. It, yeah, it is a thing. It's really interesting. I've I've actually done a TV show in the past. Oh, no, I take that back. Maybe I didn't do a TV show. You know what I did? I did a video. That's right. We just did a little online video. I can't even tell you where where you could find it because it wasn't a video that I did for me. Anyway, there are these companies that will take paint. And there's paint recycling programs. You take your old paint, whether it has any liquid in there or it's all dried up, it doesn't matter. You take it back to certain You know, we're going to call it redemption centers, but you don't get any money back for it. It's just a dumping place. I don't even know if they charge you if you bring all your old paint back. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure about that. Anyway, what they'll do is that they'll take it to these recycling places where they sort the different paints out. Then they, they try to color match 
all the paints, the darks with the darks, the medium dark with the medium dark, the light, the medium light, all with each other, and they dump it all out. Now, for those cans that are already dried out, they do something kind of slick with it. They'll take and they will punch out the dirt out of that can. I mean, not the dirt. Punch out the paint out of that can. Then they put them in a cement mixer. I believe it's a cement mixer. And it twirls around and it busts up the paint into small particles. Almost like like little nuggets, if you may. Then they paint the paint. They'll paint it gold. They'll paint it silver. They'll paint it green. They'll pa- they paint it a menagerie of different colors. Then they package it up and they sell it back to you. And I have to admit, it is pretty stuff. You put it in the landscape, looks really sharp. Is there a catch? Oh, yeah, it's a catch. You're putting paint in your landscape. The paint probably won't hurt your plants, but it's not definitely good for it either. If you were to take a can of paint and you throw it on your plants, is that going to hurt it? It's mostly water, but it has paint in there. I would never do it. And the other thing is this. The stench that comes off there is paint. It's Your mulch smells like paint literally for months. And then every time you disturb it, that paint, that latex uh, scent comes back through. So I guess if you could stomach that, it might be good. I wouldn't use it. I'm Nick Federoff, and you've been listening to Nick Federoff on Gardening.